Hey, real quick, before we get started today, I want you to turn to your neighbor and I want you to share with them your go-to excuse for getting out of something. Now, if you're a husband with a wife, you may turn to somebody else and share that. You don't want to spill the beans. Just turn to your neighbor and share what's your favorite go-to excuse to get out of doing something. All right, thank you for sharing with one another. Now, what I I want you to do now is I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, you can't use that excuse here at church today, okay? Yeah, tell them, no, tell them, seriously, turn and tell them, you cannot use that excuse here at church today. Because here's the thing, there is someone here today who wants to ask you a very important question. And the question is, are you available Now, before you young and singles get really excited thinking where I may be heading with this message, let me temper the enthusiasm here. This is not a dating or a courtship message, okay? But there is somebody in the room who seriously wants to ask if you're available, and his name is Jesus. And he wants to know, are you available? Um, It's important that we all have the same understanding of terms, okay? So before we get started, we're going to define our terms, okay? We're going to have common grammar today, um, and we need to define what available is, okay? So available, so we're all on the same page here, is an adjective that means able to be used or obtained at someone else's disposal. And what I really like and what I want to land on Our thought for today is present or ready for immediate use. Now, here's the deal. Sometimes when we think about this word available or availability, we immediately start thinking about the second half of that word, right? The able or ability part of the word. But may I tell you, in the kingdom of God, God is not so much concerned with your ability. He's focused on the first half of that word, which is the avail part. The, the, the willing and the readiness to say yes to him, to his plan and purpose that he has for your life. So the question is, are you available? Is, are you willing to say yes? So before we get in our text today, let me set the scene. And man, Pastor Don did an amazing job last week just narrating the story of Esther. I'm not going to do that great of a job with that. But let me try and set the scene for you, though. We are in Luke chapter 9, and Luke chapter 9 opens with Jesus sending out the 12 on ministry together. He empowers them and equips them to do ministry. There is great momentum in the area of Israel where they are ministering. There's momentum about the movement and what is going on. Jesus' reputation has spread all the way to the highest office of power in Israel. Things are going great. They start a food program. They're feeding people. People are coming to know about the kingdom. Uh, People who are are, are oppressed and demon-possessed are being delivered. People who are sick are being healed. God's kingdom is expanding and growing. And it's with this enthusiasm. It is with this momentum. It is with this energy that Jesus is traveling with his disciples along with some other individuals. And this is where we land in our text today. Luke chapter 9, starting with verse 57. As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in. And birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. So I'd ask us the question today, will you count the cost? Will you count the cost of your yes? Here's the deal. I just pictured, again, this, again there's momentum around the kingdom of God. There's all this energy. And there's this really impulsive person in the crowd, right? And, I mean, they're just kind of caught up along with the energy. And they just blurred out, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And Jesus kind of pauses for a moment and says, hey, fellas, slow your roll a little bit here. Are you willing to count the cost of your yes? 
I remember being eight years old and we were at, after church and it was like one of those fifth Sunday dinner times, you know, and it, we were outside and there were some friends of mine. We were just kind of hanging out and talking and having fun together. And I always fancied myself to be trying to be a funny kid. I was the person, the kid in class, Sunday school teachers hated me. Ranger leaders hated me. I mean, I, I just, I, you know, I was that attention seeking kid doing all this kind of stuff. And I, so I remember we're sitting there talking with this group of friends and a high school student walks up and I'm holding my white styrofoam cup with red Kool-Aid in it. And as he walks up and he begins engaging us, you know, elementary students in conversation, this thought comes into my head. I wonder what would happen if I pitched my red cup of Kool-Aid on his white, pristine shirt. And so again, the thought comes into my mind and I almost immediately react and I pitch my red cup of Kool-Aid on him and it just spills all over his shirt, staining, it's running down. But I will tell you, I did not count the cost of that decision because that high school student hauled back and punched me square in the mouth. I mean, I thought my teeth were gone. I mean, I just, I mean, he destroyed me and rightly so. Um, But I did this because I did not count the cost. I'm telling you from that day forward, anytime an impulsive thought came through my head, I'm like, oh, wait, wait, wait. Do I really want to act on that? You know, oftentimes though, us in America, we, we just get caught up with culture. We get caught up with the busyness and the hype and the schedule and our, our calendars get bloated. And, and I mean, we're just so overcommitted with so many things. But what I say that about a year ago in March, COVID came along and it punched us in the mouth. And we quickly began to wake up and to realize what all these yeses are costing us what it is costing our relationship with Jesus, what's it costing our family and friends, what what, what our yeses were costing our church and our community, what the yes was costing us. And I would say that as we emerge, as we establish a new normal, as you begin to put things on your calendar, as you begin to put things on your plate, what I would ask you today, Jesus would ask the question, are you available? Are the things that you're adding back into your life, are they things that have kingdom value? Are they things that have kingdom purpose? Because I'm going to tell you right now, the kingdom is about relationships. The kingdom of God is first and foremost relational. What does Jesus say? I mean, everything, the entire Bible can be summed up in two things. Do you love God with your whole being? And do you love your neighbor as yourself? It revolves around other people. And so this is kingdom values. This is kingdom priorities. And honestly, we have went about for decades, for years, not counting the cost of our yeses, not counting the cost of us being overcommitted. And it has strained relationships. It has strained our relationship with Jesus where we don't have time to privately seek him and pursue him. It's cost us time with family and friends and those points of connection with each other because we are just too busy to relate and connect. It's cost us time investing in our church and in our community, being involved and discipling others and being relational with other people. All of these things have cost us. The truth is, is that our yes, when you say yes to something, it means you say no to something else. I mean, I think you know this, but there's seriously 24 hours in a day. Okay, it's not like Monday through Friday, there's 25 or 20. There's seriously 24 hours in a day, and we all have that. We all have to steward our time. And so does your life, does your yeses, does it reflect those things? Does it reflect the kingdom values and priorities in life? You see, our daily decisions regarding our schedule, they're not insignificant. They actually point our life in a direction that it will go. I have told students for years, the best indication of what you're going to be doing tomorrow is to look at what are you doing today. The best indication of what you're going to be doing next week is to look at what are you doing this week. 
The best indication of what you're going to be doing next month, what are you doing this month? The best indication of what you're doing this year, what are you going to, to be doing? You got, what I'm, you got where I'm going. Now. You see where I'm heading. I mean, it, what are you doing today? Because these things, it determines the direction of our lives. And so are we willing to count the cost of our yes, and will our yes reflect kingdom priorities? Let's look at verse 59 together. He said to another person, come, follow me. The man agreed, but, and here's the condition. He said, Lord, first, let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. So I would have us consider today, are there conditions to your availability? Are there conditions to your availability? Because oftentimes, if we are honest, we do, maybe on even some uh, subconscious level, there are conditions to that yes to God, that availability to God. This young man, he, he tells Jesus, yes, I agree, I will follow you wherever you go, but first... Here's the condition, and he throws it out. And honestly, it seems reasonable on the surface, right, to go home. But as we look at it, it's ultimately this veiled excuse from what? Being immediately present and ready and available for use. So, I mean, looking through commentaries and information, there's lots of thought about, uh, about this person's response. I mean, one is maybe his father really did die and he, he has to go home and take care of those obligations and responsibilities. Maybe he's talking about in the Jewish custom, burial was a year-long period from when the person would be buried to like a year later they would be put in that box. Dr. Wave talked about that. Remember the box of, uh, the, uh, help me out here. Yes, yes. The, the ossuary that was found, and it was Jesus' brother James, remember finding that? So that was like a year-long process that would, take, that would take place there. So was he saying, you know, Jesus, let me delay my following you so I can take care of this? He, you know what? He may have also been, it's possible that his father wasn't even dead, wasn't even close to being dead. Because this phrase, it was actually common in Middle East culture, and it emphasized the son's responsibility to help the father in the family business until he passed on, that he would handle the affairs. And so if that's the case, there was going to be this long and lengthy delay in following Jesus and following him. And so whatever the scenario was here, the ultimate uh, the reality was that there was a condition to his availability. And I would say for us, uh, and, and what he was saying here is, I'm going to do what is normal. I'm going to do what is expected. And I would ask us to reflect on the values of our culture, the values that are so ingrained in us. I mean, we are products of our environment that sometimes we act and behave in ways um, and we don't even really think about a note because it's just a product of where we've grown up at, what we've come to believe is true. And in our culture, we value. It is a priority to be comfortable and for things to be convenient. That is top priority. Everything in our culture, it caters to our sense of comfort and convenience. It's a value and a right as an American, right? To be comfortable and convenient. I mean, how many of you, now thankfully it's kind of mild outside today, but how many of you, if it was 100 degrees outside and you, you knew the air wasn't working at Central, you would choose to come out to be in service today? I mean, most of us know, probably choose to stay, maybe watch online at home, right? I mean, because we want to be comfortable. I would want to sit here and sweat, right? I mean, there's so many things. Um, social media, every, everything. I mean, the algorithms that sit in your internet searches and your social media, it caters to your desires, what you want. And so it just creates within all of us this worldview that the world revolves around me that the whole goal and priority of life is to be comfortable and for things to be convenient. But I, I just want to bust the bubble today. Jesus is not one bit concerned about your comfortability. He's not one bit concerned if something is convenient for you. His goal is for not to you to arrive at to heaven and say, Jesus, 
I made it through life comfortable. That is not his goal. His question is, is are we committed? Are we committed? Is our yes committed? Are we going to cave into culture, into just ways of thinking that, oh, you know what, it's, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't fit well with me. It's not comfortable for me, so Jesus, I'm not going to go there with you. Too often we follow lock and step with culture. We are committed to what is normal, familiar, comfortable, and convenient. What I'm sharing with you today is something that's very personal to me. This is actually something Jesus has preached to me for about five months. And it started one night with our middle school group in discussion. And those of you guys, I mean, most of you know, I mean, middle school students, they're not known for their great theological insight, right? I mean, they're not known for just these brilliant theological minds. I mean, one minute we're talking about Jesus, and the next minute we're talking about dinosaurs and video games. I mean, just easily it transitions there, right? But one night we are considering together and pondering the question, like, how do we know? What are some indicators that we might look for that would tell us if we are kind of doing our own thing and expecting God to follow along? Or are we really going about life doing God's thing? And so that question hung out there in the air for a moment. And then one of our brilliant middle school students spoke up and said, I think, I think an indication may be if we are always comfortable. That may be an indicator that we're doing more of our own thing and not as much of God's thing. I'm going to tell you, mic drop right in the middle of the room. I mean, the conversation could have sat there for a month and pondering that. And that question literally began to hang over my heart and over my mind. And I just, it began to marinate there. And, and I just began to ponder it until one day I had a conversation in the boardroom with Pastor Carter and Pastor Jim. And they asked me if I would be willing to consider coming on staff full time as family ministries pastor. And I'm going to tell you, I immediately started feeling uncomfortable. I mean, all these questions began to race through my mind. I mean, walking away from a, you know, a counseling career, 14 years at Pipkin Middle School, halfway to retirement, tenure as an educator. I mean, if I slip up and make a mistake here, say something dumb behind the pulpit, Pastor Jim could be like, you're out of here. You're gone. I mean, or Pastor Jim, God leads him somewhere else and someone new comes in. They're like, yeah, we don't like that family ministry's guy. I mean, I mean, all these things begin to go through my head as far as what this, this sense of comfortable and, and convenience. I mean, I, I mean, not that being a school counselor is easy and a middle school pastor is easy, but it was familiar. It was comfortable. But the whole time I just begin to sense God. Are you willing to be uncomfortable? Are you willing to be available? And I came to a moment that just said, God, yes, I am. This is what you have for me. And as uncomfortable as it may be, as unfamiliar as it may be, I am willing to say yes to you. Will you say yes, even if it causes you to feel uncomfortable, even if it's something that's unfamiliar to you? I mean, what is it that makes a young family move all the way from the state of Pennsylvania to come to Springfield, Missouri, to be a worship pastor at a place where there's no family, no roots, no deep relational connections? That is uncomfortable, it's unfamiliar, but when Jesus asks you, are you available? The answer is yes, I am what makes students go to their schools, either middle school or high school, and walk through the halls of their building, not with the priority of up in my reputation and up in my cred, but I want to rep Jesus here. I want to show extreme kindness to those in my halls and love them well. What is it? It's when Jesus asks, are you available? We say yes to him. There's scenario after scenario that we could go up that, that causes us to be comfortable. But the question is, is will you allow Jesus to lead you into the uncomfortable? Will you allow him to lead you there? Lastly, verse 61. Another said, yes, Lord, I will follow you. But first, let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. 
I'd ask us to consider the question here, to whom does your heart belong? I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, who has your heart? Where does it belong? Because this is the truth. The truth is, is that we are committed to what we desire. We do what we desire. Desire drives behavior. And when we look at this individual and Jesus, again, this seems like a harmless request, but ultimately it reveals where his heart belonged. And Jesus says, look, if you put your hand to the plow and you look back, you, I mean, you look back because this is where your heart is. This is where, this is, this is where your desires are landing you. You're not part of the kingdom of God. I mean, there's no part of pursuing. He wants us to be all in. To be all in. And this reminds me of two stories in the Old Testament. The first is Lot and his wife as they flee the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And God says, look, I want you to flee to salvation. I want you to flee to safety. I want, I want to save you. And knowing that destruction was coming as, as fire and brimstone is raining down in the city, what does Lot's wife do? She turns and she looks back because her heart was in the city. That's where her heart belonged. That's where it was. She did not want to leave and flee to safety, to flee to salvation, to flee to what God had for them. Our heart follows our treasure. Uh, another one is in 1 Kings chapter 19, Elisha being called by Elijah. Elijah walks by as Elisha is plowing in the field and he throws his mantle on Elisha, calling him to follow him. Elisha says, wait, first, let me go home and say goodbye to my family. And it, it almost parallels and mirrors what we're seeing happen here in Luke. But the motivation of the two individuals is completely different. You see, Elisha goes home to say goodbye to his family, to kiss his parents to goodbye, to abandon his home and his livelihood for the sake of the Lord. And in an act to show that he meant business, he destroys the plow, he slaughters the oxen, and it serves as an opportunity for him to be able to say, look, if this following Elijah thing doesn't work out, I've always got my home to fall back on. I've always got this to go back to. But an act of showing he's severing all ties with this other way of life. He's, he's, he destroys the plow, he, de, he, he sacrifices the oxen, and he follows after Elijah. Where we see here in Luke, let me go home, say goodbye to my family. Set things up, then in case the stuff gets too uncomfortable, and stuff, in case things get too hard, I got something to fall back on. His heart was not with the kingdom and kingdom priorities. Paul Tripp, he writes in his book, Dangerous Calling. He says, if you are ever going to be an ambassador in the hands of a God of glorious and gracious power, you must die. You must die to your plans for your own life. You must die to your self-focused dreams of success. You must die to your demands for comfort and ease. You must die to your demands for pleasure, acclaim, prominence, and respect. You must die to your desire to be in control. You must die to your own kingship. You must die to the pursuit of your own glory in order to take up the cause of the glory of another. You must die to the control over your own time. You must die. Are you available? Our, and the answer to that question reveals where our heart is at. Is it in following Jesus? It is in pursuing him and doing what he has for us. But here's the thing, before we ever respond to that question, before we ever say yes to Jesus, I want you to know today that Jesus has already completely made himself available to you. Before you ever say yes, Jesus has made himself available to you. Before you took your first breath, Jesus said, I want him. I want her. I want them part of my kingdom. Before you ever accomplished anything of value, Jesus chose you to be part of his kingdom. 
Before Jesus is asking you of your availability to Him, He has completely made Himself available to you. Before He asks us to serve Him, He serves us well. Even when we were still His enemies, Christ died for our restoration, for our healing, and for our empowerment. He has made Himself available to us 24-7. The question is, are we going to be available to him? To whatever he says, to whatever, however he wants to use us, to however he sees fit to use us in the place he has planted us, are we willing to say yes to him? Will we count the cost of our yeses? Will we do that? Will we count the cost to all the yeses? Are there conditions to our availability? And ultimately, to whom does our heart belong? 